Well, good evening. I want to welcome you uh, to Catalina Foothills Church. My name is John Stone, and I'm the pastor here. And it's a really an honor and privilege to have you come out with us tonight and tomorrow morning and to think uh, deeply about your marriage. And uh, it'll be a really good time and a really encouraging time. Uh, if you're not normally uh, with us, we're really glad to have you. Just a couple of points of information. We have some snacks, water, food, coffee back in here. And if you go out that exit that's my left and your right and take an immediate left and a left, that's where our restrooms are, men and women. So you can go out there at any time. John will give us some breaks. Um, so thanks for being with us tonight. It's my privilege I'm going to introduce John and then pray. It's my privilege tonight to introduce John Cox to you. Now, um, where my wife grew up and where I grew up, normally what we would do at this point is we would tell you all the people we know that he knows. And then we would really talk up which school he went to and why that was important and all, everybody would ooh and ah. If I told you all of that about John Cox, you'd be bored out of your mind. It would mean nothing to you, which is why Tucson's one of the greatest cities in the world, that you know nothing about these obscure schools in Jackson, Mississippi and Ole Miss and State and all that kind of stuff. And, but we can say this, John Cox went to the right schools. John Cox knows the right people, that's me. Um, and I, I sort of slowly got to know John Cox through the years when we lived in Jackson, Mississippi for a little while, Marissa and I, when we first got married and then moved away, but my first real experience of being around John was when I invited him to come and teach at our RUF staff training. And John was real excited about that. That was, a, I don't know, 2015. And he said, this is the first time I'll ever get to do all my marriage stuff. And uh, it's the most compliments I ever got on a staff training, which made me feel bad about the rest of my staff trainings, <laughs> but good about that one. And th this is what I can really say about John Cox, um, John has the privilege and the calling and the honor of sitting with people in his office 50 minutes at a time and walking into the valley of the shadow of death. That's what counselors do. They, they close the door, they become a friend, and they walk with people through really hard things, which almost triply qualifies you to help us think about our marriages. Uh, John, we really appreciate you being here. John's come a long way from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, after today's weather, he may not go back. Um, and we're thankful for, this, for you doing this. Let me pray for us, and we'll have John come and lead us through our time together. Father, we thank you for the privilege of gathering and uh, thinking about our marriage. And we want our marriages to reflect your love for us. Uh, that image in Ephesians 5 is that Jesus has loved us uh, the way that a husband ought to love a wife and a wife ought to love a husband. It's a picture of the gospel. So give us gospel grace this weekend. Give John stamina and courage and help in this. And just lead us. Pour out the Holy Spirit. It's, it's just so easy to be callous. It's so easy to be uh, closed. It's so easy, easy to be scared about marriage. But give us courage and give us humility and give us ears to hear. And we pray this, Jesus, for your name's sake. Amen. As John comes up, I'm going to say one other thing. You got a Finders Keeper four-week follow-up announcement. Now, you don't have to do this, but one of the things we wanted to offer to our church is not this weekend, but starting next weekend, we're going to do four Sunday nights at the church from 5.30 to 7. We're going to offer free dinner. Now, we are skipping the Super Bowl. We're smart. Uh, but we'll do four weeks, and then we're going to do a little talk and a discussion so that you can process this. So, John... Thank you. Which basically means if I can't answer your questions, then he's going to handle it easy the next few weeks. It's, sure. So I'll don't fret. That. Yeah, whatever. Don't fret. Uh, John Stone and Marissa have both, in very different ways, given to me and to my family. Y'all are very blessed to have them here giving to you guys. And I'm delighted and honored to be here um, with y'all. I think after the sunset, I just saw, I won't ever go back to Mississippi. Uh, not, you know, whatever about the weather, that was phenomenal. Um, I am delighted to be here. It's so exciting to see how many of you have brought your spouses here for me to fix this weekend. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be neat, y'all, you know, watching them grow and change. It's going to be really, it's going to be great. 
Uh, we welcome all of y'all uh, at home on the live stream. We invite you into our midst. We're glad you were here. Welcome to our marriage conference. I call it Finders Keepers. Um, I used to call it John's 10 Easy Steps to Hot Racy Romance, but then I was told you can't say hot and racy in church. So I'm, I'm you know, to, but my hope is that this is going to be a little bit different from other marriage conferences maybe you've attended. I'm going to try to skip over the kind of things you can get in your basic marriage book, you know, like getaway weekends and five meaningful touches and men are like microwaves and women are like crock pots, you know, and try to go a little deeper, all right, you know. Um, what I want to talk about is this. You know those ways in which you wish that you were closer, uh, but you're not? Or those, those ways in which you can, you know, wish you weren't so snippy or snarky, but you are? Or those ways in which, you know, you, you begin having a conversation about, you know, the car insurance, and pretty soon it turns into a fight, and then three hours later, somebody's going, well, maybe we should just split up, you know, and you're going, how did this happen? Don't you hate that? Don't you wonder why we do that junk uh, and how we can stop that or how we can grow there? I want to give you some traction for thinking about that um, this weekend. I want us to talk about how marriages work. An alternative title for this conference could be Understanding Marriage, because I'm going to kind of deconstruct marriage a little bit and try to get you sort of the therapist's eye view of the dynamics that are going on in a relationship. I want to give you some categories for thinking about why we can be such gizmos in our relationship with one another. Um, marriages don't learn just by learning, don't grow just by learning communication skills, okay? I want to teach you how, you, how they grow. So we're going to talk a lot about marriage and dating, finders, keepers, means this. It's a, this is a conference to, to give to you guys who are married, help you keep your relationship. But the principles are the same even if you're trying to develop a romantic relationship. If you're single with us, we got any singles? None here. I assume there's some at home then. Um, we'll, we, the same principles that apply to helping your marriage get better are the same kind of things that I want to teach singles. They're the things that um, help develop a healthy romantic relationship, all right? Um, my wife Norma and I have been married for 38 years. Yeah, 38 years. We're now grandparents, which is just rocks. In fact, what I thought we'd do this weekend is I've got six or 800 slides of my grandchildren, and I'd just like to go through them. <laughs> and then we can do Q&A, and I'll be glad to take any questions you have about them. Um, uh, we have three kids, all of whom are grown now and have jobs and don't live at home, which is on my resume, all right? Uh, it should be. Um, but regarding my family life, um, contrary to what I'm sure you believe, my speaking on marriage did not begin by my wife saying, oh, honey, you've got to share your secrets, you know? <laughs> You've got you've to tell other husbands how you do it, because other wives are missing out. You make marriage so blissful, you know, it's almost selfish of you to not get on the, get on the circuit, you know? That's not how it happened. i got to promise you. I'm as big of a knuckleheaded husband as the rest of you. Uh, you will hear some stories of my knuckleheadedness this weekend. My professional credentials will have to suffice, um, you know, because... I make a lot of mistakes, still do. I wrote a parenting book, which we'll talk about later. You'll notice I haven't written, written a marriage book because I'm a lot better parent than I am a husband. But anyway, it's just not going to sound like I'm that big of a goofball because speakers always sound like they're really great at what they do, right? But, you know, this woman came up to my wife once after a conference, and she said to my wife, all right, oh, what must it be like to be married to him? And my wife tactfully said, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> Thanks, Norm. All right, let's get started. We got miles to go tonight and tomorrow. I'm going to start by telling you kind of big picture of what I believe is the biggest problem in marriage. You know, the real reason that all of us struggle. I'm not going to have a lot of suspense and build up. I'm just going to spill the beans right here at the beginning of the conference. And I'm going to tell you 
what that problem is by reminding you a little bit of what I do every day. John said I am a clinical psychologist. That is who I am and what I do. And I do sort of what you would think I would do. I have a couch and a pipe and a sweater, <laughs> you know, a couple of turtlenecks. You know, I do therapy, mostly with adults, uh, you know, depression, anxiety, marriage problems, that kind of thing. Um, now, I don't know how many of y'all have ever gone to therapy before, but most people don't go to therapy just for kicks. You know, like nobody comes and says, hey, doc, I just thought it'd be fun to, you know, look at my inner world. You know, nobody does that. Um, people come to therapy because they have a owie. They got a boo-boo. You know, something hurts. Something's not working right. In other words, they have a symptom or a problem. Depression, anxiety, OCD, bipolar, whatever, out of control behaviors. Pick a card. Now, given that symptom, that problem, there's a backstory to it. And this is where it gets important. People have marriage problems or have, um, you know, emotional disruption symptoms or struggle with sin in their life, not because they have a, you know, they're, they're lazy or stupid or have a chemical imbalance. The real reason that people struggle, the real reason that we get symptoms is that life and our relationships are requiring something of us and we're missing some of the software to do it. That's the model I want you to have this weekend. God made us in such a way that in order to make life work or be functional or do relationships or have friends or have a job or get married or buy a car, He made us to, be, to have to be able to do certain things, to have certain abilities, things I call character abilities, sort of like software, okay? In other words, the ability which we have to learn to love or trust or be strong or be forgiving or manage my emotions, these are abilities and we're not born with them, okay? So bottom line here, marriage, life requires skills, right? Like Napoleon Dynamite. Hey, Pedro, you've got skills, you know, same kind of thing. There's a sense in which you could say being a functional person in life or in relationships is kind of like being a car. Think about it. In order to work well, a car has to be able to do lots of things. It has to be able to go, and it has to be able to stop, and it has to be able to turn. In Mississippi, it needs an air conditioner, okay? Now, think about that car. It's got everything, and let's say it's missing brakes. It can't do brakes so well. Well, that's fine. As long as it's driving down the freeway of life until there's a traffic jam. And then all of a sudden you're like pump, 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 but you don't have brakes and you slam into that Kia Soul that's sitting in the traffic jam. Now, you wanted to stop, right? You didn't want to hit him, right? But you don't have brakes. You're lacking something. So what are the brakes, the steering wheels, the gas pedals for humans? Well, think about it. We get married, all right? Do we have the ability to be emotionally close? Did we learn that? We have to be taught that, okay? Or is it after, my, after the honeymoon, it's me and my best friend, the remote control, you know? Did I learn the ability to be emotionally connected? Was I taught that? Was that part of my software package, okay? Now, if someone can't do that, you get married and your spouse is not really able to be very emotionally connected, it's not that they don't care or that you're not important to them. It's probably that they never learned it, okay? They're missing some software. Do we go to destructive behaviors and our impulses? Can I not control myself in things I do? Anger or acting out or being irresponsible with money? Of course, marriage problem, right? Maybe, but maybe they never learned that ability to set limits on their impulses. That's an ability we have to be taught in relationships. Can they manage difficult people? Can they stand up to their boss? Can they stand up to their jerky spouse? Can they make sense of forgiveness? These are character abilities that we are not born with that we have to learn and develop in relationships, all right? So, these are a shadow of the abilities we need to do life. We're going to look at them in detail tonight. 
But here's the secret. I don't know if you've been keeping up with current events, but every one of us are missing a ton of these abilities. All right? So let me tell you what the biggest problem in marriage is. The biggest problem in marriage, if you take two people who are fallen and screwed up and incomplete and sinful to boot and put them in the same house together, both of whom are missing character abilities that God created us to have to have to make life work, they're going to start encountering the challenges in marriage, the things that marriage absolutely requires to be intimate or to resolve conflict or to admit failure or to push back on my own sinfulness. And guess what? They're going to reach for that brake pedal and pump, 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 and nothing's going to happen, and they're going to hurt you again. Okay? And the car goes careening through the plate glass window of the quickie mart. Now, that's going to happen even though they don't want to. Even though they're trying harder, even though they've prayed long and hard about this, and presto, you're having the same fight you've had since college. Okay? So wife says, I don't feel like we're close anymore. And husbands can go, oh, right? Um, (laughs) Okay, now, why is that? Maybe he never learned the ability to be emotionally connected. Maybe she never learned the ability to hold on to love and trust. I'm not sure. But I want you to begin thinking about marriage problems tonight with me, not as, ooh, we have a crummy marriage, ooh, we're not close. I want to give you categories for thinking about the things that make humans work, what you need in your software, what I use every day in my office with clients dealing with marriages or depression or panic attacks. And I want you to be thinking about your marriage with those sort of categories, all right? So here's my point as we start off. We come to marriage basically being told that this is going to be the place where at last I'm going to find fulfillment and joy, all right? Or, you know, you singles, you're, you're, you're told, you know, you're not happy because you're not married, right? Not really recognizing that romantic relationships will require a ton of abilities that we're going to talk about. So we start running into things that I can't do or that you can't do. And so things don't get done. And we think, oh my gosh, we have marriage problems, right? I know I should have married that investment banker, you know. But here's the problem. The problem is not with your marriage. The problem is that we're both lacking abilities that we absolutely have to have to make marriage work. So, good news, bad news moment. Good news. Nobody's the bad guy. Neither one of you is to blame. It's not your fault. All right? Bad news. You're both screwed up. <laughs> In other words, bad news, you're both working on this very difficult challenge of marriage, both of you incomplete in the things that God created you to have in His image. You're both missing some pieces. You both contribute to the problem. You're not bad guys, you're incomplete guys, all right? I told a couple not long ago, they were talking about getting a divorce, and I said, you know, I mean, I know you guys pretty well, and to be honest with you, you're kind of wanting just to trade in this car. The truth is that the problem isn't with the car. The problem is you guys are both terrible drivers. You know, you don't need a new car. You need driver's ed, all right? So point one in John's marriage conference, the problem is not in your marriage. The problem is that we're all lacking abilities in our hearts and in our characters, and we're going to talk about what they are, all right? So here's the correct question, and the question that I think will change your marriage How do we start growing together, you and me, to learn to do married stuff better? What do we need in our software? What do I need to learn to be able to love and to be loved better? All right? What are those abilities? You learn that. You start thinking like that, and that will enrich your marriage, okay? In other words, before we do a marriage, we tricked y'all here. This isn't a marriage conference. This is a you conference, all right? This is a conference to invite you to start thinking, what is it that, that, that I need in my heart to do relationship well, and what might I be missing? And what might my spouse be missing? And I want you to ask it in that order, please, okay? So, 
this is a you conference first in a sense, and then you better bring that back to your relationship. Now, this is going to do two things. Number one, it's going to stop the blame. This is huge. I was telling a couple yesterday, I was telling them, I said, you know, one of the problems in marriage is that couples run into a problem, and what every couple I know does is instead of actually working to solve the problem together and to figure out together what, what do we do to make this better, they start blaming one another. They start going, well, this wouldn't happen if you, blah, 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 oh, yeah, me? Well, what about you? And they're basically playing badness hot potato forever, and guess who's all lonesome and nobody's even talking about him anymore? Mr. Problem, all right? In other words, the, the essence of what we all do in our marriages is we run into yuck in our relationship, and instead of actually growing, <laughs> we fight about it. Like, what's wrong with you? There's nothing wrong with me. What about you? And we turn the problem into a blame fest. Now, one of the things that I want to change by beginning the way I have is to say, guess what? The problem is not your marriage. The problem is both of you are incomplete. You following me? So nobody's the bad guy. We got to stop the blame thing. I call it he language and she language. What I hear in my office all the time. You don't believe what he did. You're not going to believe what she said. Okay, it's he language, she language. All right. And basically, all that does is make you hate each other instead of solving the problem. Um, <clears throat> but our default is blame. Now we learned this technique from our beloved parents. Adam and Eve. Think about it. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when they first sinned. What happened then? Number one, they hid, right? And number two, God comes and says, who told you you were naked? He says to Adam. And Adam does what any self-respecting husband would do, right? He blames his wife, right? Actually, if you go back and look at it, he blames Eve and God. In one sentence, the woman who you gave to me gave me, and I'm thinking, that's pretty good for your first day as a sinner. I mean, the, it's, like, it's like hitting a double as a rookie in the big leagues. You know, he's like, this guy's got it. He's got something. Anyway, in case you haven't noticed, this blame thing doesn't get you very far, and it doesn't solve the problem you're blaming about, and it doesn't get you much fulfillment in your marriage. And I don't know about y'all, but rarely does your spouse go, you know what, you're right, I am the bad guy, right? <laughs> so instead of talking about blame, I want us to begin like the gospel. I, I, I tend to forget my slides. Let's begin like the gospel and say, let's quit the condemnation and the blame. Let's quit the who's the bad guy thing. We both need grace. We both need to grow here. We both got software problems. No one's the bad guy. Our junk is the bad guy. All right? Here's something I tell couples all the time. Let me see if I can do this. Ooh, good. Here's the secret of the universe. All right, I tell couples this all the time. Secret, there are four people in your marriage. There's you, and there's her, and there's little you, six-year-old you, and there's six-year-old her, all right? Now, you two guys, y'all get along just fine. But then he comes in from work one day, and he goes, hey, honey, we're having meatloaf again. Now, she doesn't hear that. Her six-year-old does, and like, oh, my gosh. Nothing's good enough for you. Now, big him doesn't hear that. Little him does. Oh my gosh, I can't even say my preference in, in meals without you getting on my case again. And they're, you know, off to the races forever. All right? So it's super important for you to realize this, this, this character that's so incomplete inside of all of us. It's like we're carrying around these two six-year-olds. And you guys love each other just fine. And you're sitting there listening to the six-year-olds fight. All right? Super important. By the way, first time I ever did this example, it was sort of impromptu, and I wasn't thinking, and I used circles. <laughs> and so I all of a sudden had a giant eighth grade boy joke, on the, and I'm like, okay, so these are squares. Do you see it? They're squares. 
You only do that once. <laughs> All right, so one thing you have in common is that you're both incomplete, and you both contribute to the problem, and you both want it to stop hurting. You know, those couples who say to me, Lee, got nothing in common. I kind of will go, well, you have in common that you're both hurting, and you both want the hurt to stop. In that sense, you're same and samesies, you know? So step one, we're doing the same thing the gospel does. The gospel starts your relationship with God with grace. It says, if we, if we count iniquities, who can stand? Let's begin by saying, how do we make it safe for you to be screwed up and me to be screwed up? And hey, let's grow, how about it? Instead of bashing each other's heads against the wall. All right? So, first step is like the gospel. How do we make it safe to be incomplete, to hurt one another, to be fallen? All right? Number two, gospel doesn't stop with grace. So we're falling and it's safe, so how do we grow? Let's, let's start looking more like Christ, how about it, all right? And this is where we're going to go this weekend. What's broken in us? What keeps us from having a good marriage? How do we grow there? I want you looking at that as not enemies, but as friends. Broken, fallen friends, but a growth marriage, not a blame marriage hey, honey, we're both incomplete here. Let's let Cox help us grow, all right? So what do we have to have, to, to have ticking inside of us in order to make relationship work well, to be good drivers of this car? We're going to talk about all four of them tonight. We're going to look at two of them in more detail tomorrow. You can ask Q&A about any of them that you want. And as we go through them, I want you thinking, could this be one of my blind spots? Could this be one of those places that I'm not so good at? And secondly, is, could this be a place my spouse is not so good? And I want you thinking about that together and talking about that together. This is a great topic for date night, all right? And you singles who may be watching, I want you to be learning a grid for picking. I want you to learn what makes healthy people. And I want you thinking about this grid so you can be growing yourself. The healthier you are, the better picker you will be. Okay? And besides, basic psychological principle, we tend to marry people at a, who are about the same level of psychopathology as ourselves. So next time you're saying to your spouse, oh my gosh, you're like living with a five-year-old. You know, think about that, all right? <laughs> you're a narcissistic maniac. <laughs> all right, so what do we need character-wise to do marriage well? I call them the four I's. You know, there's no I in team. Well, there is in marriage. There's four of them. Just like Mississippi. <laughs> They are intimacy, the whole issue of closeness, connection, attachment, belonging, togetherness, the issue of identity. Can I be separate? Can I be who I am? Can I say no? Can I be an individual? Can we disagree? Issue of imperfection. How do I make sense of pain? How do I make sense of the ways you let me down? How do I make sense of the ways I'm such a failure? And fourthly, impulses, impulse control. In other words, how do I manage my emotional world? This is a biggie. This is the software package right there. All right, let's look at them. Intimacy. Relational closeness, attachment, connection. This is going to be a whole talk tomorrow. So be encouraged. There's two ways we need to be able to go regarding the whole world of intimacy. I'm going to call them, can I let you in and can I keep you in? You'll see there's going to be two ways we need to go with all of these, by the way. All right. Now, can I let you in and can I keep you in? These are going to be two of the most important aspects of your marriage. Be thinking as I talk about them, you know, did I learn these? All right. Can I let you in? Let's talk about that one first. Think about what we usually talk about in our lives. Basically, we chit-chat, you know, news, sports, and weather. Um, what do you think about the political situation? You know, what's the latest protest about? I can't believe it's going to rain on Sunday, you know. And for you guys, you're like, oh my gosh, it's 30% humidity today, you know. 
It hasn't been 30% humidity in Mississippi since like prehistoric times, you know. It's like we're like 89% humidity. It's so dry right now out there. Anyway, we, we, we chit-chat, we communicate to solve problems, like have you paid the bills yet, or what about the kids' grades, or should we remodel or move? Now, all that kind of level of communication, that's all valid, all right? And it's kind of necessary to make life happen. We're not building a commune here. We've got to make life work. But if this is all you can do is solve problems and chit-chat with people, give your opinions, then something is going to be missing, if this is the deepest you can go in terms of connecting with other people, people are not ever really going to know who I am. So let you in is the ability to know and learn and understand what it feels like to be me. Can I know what it feels like to be me? Can I share that with you? Can I communicate what it's like to be me? And can I care about what it's like to be you? Okay? Okay. Can I know what it feels like to be me? Can I share that? And can I care about what it feels like to be you? That's intimacy, gang. It's not rocket surgery, all right? But for marriage to be meaningful, we have to be able to go below the surface and let you in. Um, now, this does mean something in the feeling realm, okay? Sorry, guys. We'll talk about this more tomorrow. But hearts don't talk about the weather, Hearts say things like, I'm hurting, or I'm scared about that meeting tomorrow, or I'm proud of you for what you did at work, or I'm exhausted from dealing with the kids. Do you hear the feeling communicated there? Do you hear, do you hear the heart communicated there? Okay. God calls this abiding. When you bring really what it's like to be you into a relationship, he, he describes its absence by saying things like, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You ever hear anything like that from your spouse? <laughs> so can I need you? Can I tell you that how work stunk today? Can I try on what it felt like to you that your friend hurt you? In other words, can I bring you my heart? If you want your marriage and, and, or your dating to grow, be asking, how good am I at this? All right? And if, if, we, if we didn't learn it, that's cool. We can learn it. Remember, our bottom line here is not that we have a bad marriage or that our spouse is a jerk, but that we may be lacking this ability. So let you in is how much can I go to the emotional level and, and connect with you? Tell you who I am. Care about who you are. Now, at this point, all the relational types in the group are saying, right on, preach it, brother. This is what I thought a marriage conference was supposed to be. You know, I hope he's listening and she's elbowing in to make sure he's, you know. But intimacy for us relator types, Norm and I are backwards. In our marriage, men are from Venus, women are from Mars. I'm the emotional one in my marriage. So, you know, men get the stereotype of being the more, you know, heady, cognitive, problem-solving type, and women the more emotional. It's not always the case, I assure you. I know there are a lot of y'all out there who could agree with that, but we're backwards. I'm the one going, why are you always trying to fix my feelings? I just want you to hear my heart. Why can't you turn off that football game and talk to me? You know, I'm that guy, right? She's like, Tom Brady's on, wait, you know? I'd make some man the perfect wife, she says. <laughs> All right. But for us relator types, intimacy also means, have I developed the ability to feel love and connected inside? Okay? In other words, can I keep you in? Not just share love, but hold on to it. A legitimate problem with us relator types is that we can live our lives kind of feeling like unless you're connected to me, unless we're really talking a lot, unless there's a lot of sharing going on, you know, we must have marriage problems. Okay? Keep you in as, yeah, I want y'all working toward more connection and openness, but can you sometimes feel good just being you? or feeling grounded, or trusting that they love you even if they are watching the football game, okay? So yeah, part of, of, of love is sharing, let you in, 
But a lot of us sharing types are so often needing to feel connected all the time and belonging all the time and reassured all the time. Like if we aren't talking, we aren't okay. And so sure, your spouse can learn more about connecting, but the other part is what do we do with love when we get it? God, I see that so often. In other words, what you expect to hear at a marriage conference is, well, he talked a lot about how we should be communicating better and opening up more. And that's exactly one half true. Us connector types need to take responsibility for how much do I hold on to love when I get it. All right? Both of these pieces are essential if we're talking about intimacy. Okay? We'll talk about this more tomorrow. All right, see, these are character abilities. Can I reach out and share? Can I trust and not be needy? We're taught these in relationships. We're taught them growing up. It's not too late to be learning them. We'll talk about that later this evening. We're still in developmental relationships now in the body of Christ. We still can learn this software now. I just want you to have a grid for what these, this software is, okay? That's what's behind our marriage problems. To be asking, huh, we don't feel close. I wonder, can you let me in and can I keep you in? I want you to have this grid, all right? By the way, what happens when can't let you in and can't keep you in go out on a blind date? They get married, all right? <laughs> it's like, all I want is connection and you have no idea what I'm talking about. Please marry me, you know? <laughs> um, these are on a continuum, by the way. Nobody's absolutely one or the other, but you're going to tend toward one end or the other, and it's meaningful categories, so, you know, live with that. All right, now, if you struggle with either one of these, which you do, it's cool in the gang, all right? It's not a problem, all right? You're, you're falling. Now, admit that to your spouse or your girlfriend. Bring that to your growth places and quit fighting that blame marriage, you're both messed up. You're both missing this. And let's grow together. I want you saying, like I said earlier, hey, this is this is this can't let you in thing. This is what Cox was talking about. This is date night. All right. This is what you've been trying to get me to see. Right. Yeah. I'm not, I'm a, I'm a bozo at that. And you know what? You're a bozo at the other thing. You want to grow? All right. Now, that's what a growing marriage sounds like. All right. Not like, oh, my gosh, you've done it again. OK. The question is, we'll talk tomorrow when we talk about conflict. We're going to talk about um, intimacy and conflict tomorrow. Um, is instead of like, oh my gosh, you've done it again, I want you going more bird's eye. We're doing it again. What is it we're doing? Okay, just changing that pronoun is going to change the game for you, all right? Second I, identity. This is separateness, boundaries. There it is. Separateness, boundaries, um, individuality. In other words, even though you're one with somebody, there's still two people involved. Okay? In other words, there's more to relationships than attachment. There's more to relationships than, you know, candlelight and bath soaps and Adele music. Okay? There's also the issue of personal identity and separateness. Okay? Again, two sides. Can I be me? And can I make room for, can I let you be you, right? In other words, can we both matter here? We call this mutuality, which is as important as intimacy, okay? There's a sense in which we could say the two biggest parts of relationship, the two biggest pieces in any marriage or any relationship, period, are making sense of the issue of closeness and making sense of the issue of us both getting to exist and both mattering. And you'll see couples err on either side. Sometimes they're just all closey-closey and just the same, and there's not enough separateness and identity, and there's no room for them to disagree, or one spouse just has to follow the other one. Um, sometimes you see spouses who are just all separate and independent and apart from each other, and there's no intimacy. The balance of learning to have both of those is a real key one, all right? You can figure that out, then you get to teach the marriage conference next year, right? <laughs> and this whole issue of mutuality and intimacy 
are going to be big tomorrow because we're going to talk about intimacy and conflict. In other words, what happens if I'm me and you're you in the relationship? We're going to have conflict. And that's not bad. It's actually good. You codependent pleasers, you heard it here first, okay? All right. Number one, can I be me? This is the ability to know who I am, to know what I want, to know what I value, to have my ideas that are separate from yours. Can I say no? Can I be close to you but also be different from you? You know those people, and half of you are those people who can't, you know, say no or be me because somebody else is not going to like it, you know? And those are the people who are on like every Sunday school committee because they can't say no. You should put them on your Rolodex when you need a volunteer, you know, find these people, okay? Or these are people who can't pick a restaurant. You're like, hey, where do you want to go eat? And they're like, oh, anywhere's fine, you know? And for them, that's being nice, but you're just going to, okay, um, you know, it drives you crazy because there's not anybody there to bounce off of, all right? They often live controlled by other people or by their spouse. They kind of, in a sense, technically speaking, psychologically speaking, these people often are living in kind of a compliant child, one-down position with the world. In other words, I want to be me if it's okay with you, all right? And they're sort of always asking permission. Now, to you people, I say, in order to make your marriage work, much less your job or your parenting, we need the ability in our lives to have a seat at the table, We need to be taught, and this again is an ability that we are taught in relationships, that it's okay to be me, that it's okay to have a voice. Some people did not learn that, and you bring that into a relationship and you have havoc, all right? Children need to learn to hear no, certainly, but children are also learning to say no. And there's a funny balance when they're, you know, in that toddler age, it's like my oldest grandson is three. And he, he loves saying no. He's gotten to where he has kind of a wind-up on it. It's like, no, you know. <laughs> it's a home run. But we have to have that kind of power and sense of self is the shrink word to do relationships. I see people in my office all the time who come to see me with a lot of he and she language. And they have a lot to say about what a jerk their spouse is and uh, how they're always telling them how to drive, and always telling me how to spend money, and always sort of like telling me how I'm not loving them good enough, and ranting at me if I don't do their bidding, and all that. And, you know, that's bad and everything, right? But, but what I always tell them is, um, as they're doing all this she language, um, you know, just an idea, what if instead of complying with them all the time the way you do, or being afraid of upsetting them all the time, or of doing their bidding and then resenting it later on. What if you said to them, you know what, I'll discuss this with you. Um, I'm not really one to do the criticism thing, but I will certainly talk with you. And what you're needing and what you're wanting matters, absolutely. But what I'm wanting matters too. And I'm not really willing to do the, if I don't do what you want, you're going to fuss at me thing anymore. I want us both to matter here. I say to them, in essence, I know this is a brain teaser, but but what if what if there were two people in this marriage? In other words, you may have the best marriage in Pima County if it had you in it, you know. And they're like, "Oh my gosh!" But if I did that, she would be so upset. And they're living their whole life based on what this other person is going to do. All right. Hear me on this. That doormat style of living kills marriages as much as jerky spouses do, okay? So this is a vital ability that a car, this car has to have. The ability to be you and to stand up and to be strong and have a sense of self, all right? This isn't selfishness, by the way. Selfishness means only I matter, okay? This, is, um, this isn't all that psychological self-focus. This is what uh, biblically is spoken of as stewardship, okay? Knowing who I am and knowing what I believe and what I value and making choices in my life based on that, letting that be a factor in 
our relationship. This is like Martin Luther in the Reformation saying, here I stand, I can do no other. This is, um, you know, when Joshua leads the people in the promised land, he says to them, choose ye this day whom you will serve. As for me and my family, we'll serve Yahweh. But Now, what he's saying there is look inside of you and ask ye, who are you going to serve? In other words, he's asking us to make a choice based on what we value. That's what we're talking about here. That's what a sense of self means psychologically. You've got to have a ye, right? So a lot of people don't know who they are, and that creates a lot of havoc in their marriage. And maybe they have a bad marriage, but maybe the truth is they're missing something in their marriage, like them. <laughs> Okay. So, do you see where, where we're going and what we're doing with this? I want to deconstruct your marriage. I want to dissect it. I want to pull it apart and say, here are the pieces that make it work or not work. And I want you to be thinking about what those categories are so you can know where you need to grow. Okay. By the way, another version of the not able to be me uh, problem besides doormathood um, is passivity. The nice person sin. Okay, now, basically passivity is when we don't initiate anything in life. I don't proactively act out of what I value. So my spouse is always having to initiate everything. Okay, you know anybody like that? They're always the one having to come back and initiate us talking about that fight we had. They're the ones having to remind me to call the plumber. They're the ones always initiating sex. And if they don't, it doesn't get done. Okay? Sound familiar? Now, passivity will drive your spouse crazy. Let me, let me explain why. Passivity puts your spouse in a really nasty double bind. So, you're not going to do anything, right? So, what happens if your spouse doesn't do anything? Nothing's going to get done, right? And what happens if they do do something? Well, they're enabling you to be passive by swooping in and rescuing you and doing it for you, okay? Which is what drives them crazy. So, if you're passive, take a look at that. Which requires initiative, which is exactly what you can't do, which is why passivity is hard to fix, okay? <laughs> passivity is a tough one. All right, number two, who do the doormats usually marry? <clears throat> Mr. and Miss Too Much Me. In other words, I can't let you be you. This is the you don't like it, there's the door kind of people, all right? So the next question, can I let you be you? Or is this just all about me, 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 all right? The can't be me people can't say no. The can't let you be you people can't hear no, all right? Or bend the knee or make room for other people. Again, what happens when these two people meet? They get married. Okay? Go figure. Now, our sin nature makes this one a little tougher. I mean, basically what the Bible tells us is that uh, we're all born and basically hold a board meeting and elect ourselves chairman, right? Um, so we're kind of swimming against the sin nature current on this one, but it's vital. I had a couple of, uh, a couple of years ago um, who the husband was one of these can't let you be you people. And, and he um, grew up in the Mississippi Delta, which is a unique and interesting place, and was basically treated as the little prince his whole life. No one ever said no to him about anything, okay? So then he gets married. And you can imagine his wife ended up in therapy. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Living with him was making her crazy because she getting was getting lost in the fact that he wanted to control everything. By the way, the jerks are rarely the people who come to therapy. Usually they end up forcing, like somehow their loved ones come to therapy, you know, because they have to live with this jerk, okay? Anyway, so she comes to therapy and she's starting to learn to exist, you know, to push back, which is actually the only thing which will save this marriage, is to set limits on his controllingness and his self-centeredness, okay? So she's starting to push back more. 
Because he's not coming to therapy. He's like, that's a bunch of psychobabble stuff. But he starts put, she starts pushing back. Well, that got him to therapy. Because he's literally confused. Like, you're saying no to moi? Like, how is that possible? All right? And he was like, like you know, was charmed with me for teaching her how to do this. All right? But it's the only possible thing that could possibly help him grow up and could possibly save this relationship. If he is lacking the ability to let you be you, that has to get addressed or that's going to turn into a huge marriage problem. So, us controller types, and I'm one of these controller types. How good are we at having the ability, having been taught and shown and learned, to let our spouse be who they are? For them to say no, for them to be different from us, for us to listen when they push back on us. I've, I've got a couple right now, and anytime she disagrees with him he's like why do you have to like disrespect everything I say <laughs> like she's not disrespecting you she's just not you okay <laughs> the, the greatest sin you could commit all right this is the spiritual ability of submission of mutual submission of bending the knee to make room for someone else too all right there's an old joke you know, you do marriage conferences, you learn old marriage jokes. Old marriage joke. It's the husband. He's got, he's, he works at the bank, and he's got this interview to be, you know, to be vice president of the bank. So he's getting ready that morning, and he's putting on his tie, and he's, he's nervous. And his wife comes up to him, straightens his tie, and gives him a peck on the cheek. And she says, honey, don't you worry. Whatever happens at that interview today, you will always be vice president in this family. Right. Corny marriage joke, corny marriage joke. I got a lot of them. All right. <laughs> All right. People who live in this controlling position, like me, we need you to set limits on us, doormats. Let me speak back to you for a second. Hello, doormats, people who can't be me. Those of us who tend to be jerky and controlling, we need you to set limits on us in order for us to grow. We need you to not let us control you with our disappointment and our anger if this relationship is going to get better. Okay, please do this for us. We need you. For this marriage to work, you have got to exist in it, okay? If we begin a sentence by saying, why are you inviting them to the party? Okay? We need you to not respond like Chicken Little. Well, I thought y'all were like friends from work. And okay? I want you to say... I'm not sure whether that was a question or a criticism. Which one do you think it was? <laughs> because I don't really do the criticize me thing, but if you want to really ask a question, I will tell you, all right? That's a good, loving, powerful limit set on a kind of a jerky, critical question. Did you hear it? All right? And we might get mad when you do that, but we need you to not comply with us if this marriage is going to work, okay? That's what this relationship needs first. If you, if either one, and we can all be pushy, controlly jerks. But if, 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 if the, the first thing that a pushy, controlly jerk needs is someone to set limits on them, okay? So the only way to have a marriage with, a, with an alpha or a powder or, you know, a criticizer or a bully is you've got to learn to be comfortable saying, no, I'm really not willing to do that. I'm willing to have a discussion, but I don't really want to have a fight or a conversation that begins like that. That feels mean. Um, one of my couples I was working with um, not long ago, he said something to her, and she nailed it. She looked at him, she said, are you, are you wanting me to feel shame right now? Because it's working. I'm like, wow, that was a good shot. She set a really good limit, just a nice mirror. She didn't go, oh my gosh, quit shaming me. She, she set this lovely limit. I have another marriage conference that gets into gnarly or stuff like that. We'll have to do that one day. Um, 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 look, we'll talk about that in a minute. My podcast, I've got a lot of talks like that on it, like how to deal with difficult, jerky people. 
anyway, this is the only way to, to deal with somebody who can't let you be you, okay? Um, this is why the stereotypical Christian response of, you know, the wife who's just, you know, who's got the jerky husband and she just needs to go and submit better, you know, it doesn't work, all right? Growth for a jerky, controlly, bully kind of spouse, um, love for him or her, Christ-likeness for him or her usually means setting some hard limits. I love you, but I can't, I'm not going to sit here if you're going to rant at me, all right? I do this all the time at work, and it changes marriages, and it's so neglected in the Christian community, and it wreaks havoc, all right? More on that in Q&A if you want, all right? Anyway, to do all of that, you have to have a you, and we'll talk tomorrow about the, the, the conflict that's going to inevitably create. But again, like I said, healthy conflict's good, right? Now again, if you can't do these things, there's four of them now you may not be able to do, all right? That's fine. Good. Admit that to one another. Start bringing that to your growth places. Start asking those questions. That's how you're going to have a better marriage. Now, we're about to take a break, um, but I, I want to say this before we, before we go on. Um, I'm presupposing um, in this conference that both of you are what I call repentant. Actually, I didn't make that word up, but I like that word. All right. In other words, both of you are here kind of going, yeah, I want to grow. That both of you are here and saying, yeah, there's ways that I can, there's things I need to learn and things that I, I want to grow in myself. I'm making the, the supposition that you're not just like, oh my gosh, this is a bunch of psychobabble. It's all your fault anyway. Okay? <laughs> I'm making the assumption you're not doing that. All right? Um, I was just giving you examples about how to deal with the person who is unrepentant, who's basically like, that's a bunch of psychobabble and I'll talk to you any way I want. Um, there's a science to dealing with those kind of people, which we can talk about more. But I'm kind of presupposing you're at least both open, especially if you come here or if you're watching this. Um, if you are married to someone who isn't repentant, if you're married to someone who says, I'm not interested in working on our marriage, I'm fine, you know, do not give up hope. You can change your relationship by yourself. And let me briefly explain why before we take our break. Marriages are funny little gizmos. There's a sense in which um, a marriage is kind of like a baby mobile. You know, think about a baby mobile hanging by all the strings. Now, what, you know, that has like little Noah's Arks or something on them, right? All right, so what happens if you cut off one of the Noah's Arks in the baby mobile? Think about it. The whole baby mobile shifts, right? Marriages are like that. Marriages are systems. And if you change one cog in the clock, the whole clock tells time differently whether it wants to or not. And one of the things I've seen over and over and over again is a spouse who says, well, my spouse won't come to therapy. And I'm like, that's fine. Come into my web and let's learn these things. Let's grow. I want you to say, well, whatever he or she is willing or not willing to do, I want to grow. And what I found in 31 years of being in practice is that if you are willing to really look at your own growth in your marriage, even if your spouse is not, it will change them in spite of themselves. I don't even really know why. But marriages are systems. You change one part of that baby mobile and the whole system changes. So even if your spouse is not repentant or not open to growing, you can grow and that'll change the dynamic. I joke with my colleagues that sometimes the best marriage work I do is individual therapy with one of the spouses. Okay? So if you have a spouse who isn't willing to go, take heart. All right? I've made a bet with a woman once. I said, oh, yeah. I guarantee you, if you grow, your husband's going to change. She's like, no way. And I'm like, bet me. <laughs> I said, he doesn't change, and I give you a free session. He does change, and you give me a gift certificate for dinner for two at so-and-so. One day she comes in, she slaps that gift certificate down. I said, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, let's take a, how long a break? Your call, your um, Let's go till 7.15. Come back at 7.15. That's a little over 10 minutes.